Our first speaker today has actually been an entrepreneur since the age of 17. He's currently CEO and co-founder of Close.io. Please help me welcome to the stage, Steli Effie. This is freaky. I was just watching her on stage saying things. I'm like, I don't know what she tells you people about me. All right, so uh, first of all, they put the loudest person on a silent stage. Uh, this is, may or may not be a good idea, but raise your hand really high if you have no idea who I am, you've never heard of me before today. Really high, really proud. <sighs> okay, this is important for my ego. You know, it keeps me grounded. You people have no fucking clue who I am. Awesome. All right, that's great, that's a good start. So, uh, second question, who here has uh, never been in a silent audience before? Raise your hand. Don't worry, you're good heads with me, I've done this before. Uh, if you're wondering, I am the head, you know, the voice in your head. It's kind of more intimate, right, when you're hearing somebody, the voice uh, on it. But for me, it's much more of a struggle. I have no idea how I sound right now to you. I hope I sound good. So anytime uh, you feel like applauding, although this is a silent stage, feel free to do it. Applause is free. Awesome. I love it. All right. Uh, okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna tell you a tiny bit about me because you people don't fucking know, and then we're gonna, gonna go right into how to successfully sell in hyper-competitive markets. First, before I tell you more about myself, really quickly, raise your hand if you're in sales. Awesome. I love the people that are like undecided, they're like 50% of the time maybe, or the people that are very slow that are just like serving the room depending on how many other people self-identify as sales. I'll self-identify as sales as well. All right, uh, how many here are founders of companies? Okay, how many here are in marketing actually and wanted to hear the sales talk? I really appreciate you people, awesome. And then who here didn't raise his hand before? Raise your hand. There you go. Who the hell are you people and what do you do here? All right, we'll talk later. So uh, a little bit about myself. This is funny. Okay, so my name is Steli Efti. I'm originally from Greece, born and raised in Germany. Uh, high school dropout, serial entrepreneur. When people ask me why I've never had a real job in my life, I always tell them the truth, which is lack of options, right? I have no credentials, no skills. Nobody would ever hire me for anything useful or valuable. So I always had to start a company and then hire myself. And if I had to point to one entrepreneurial superpower, if I had any, it was always selling, communicating and driving the world forward, my companies forward, my customers' lives and companies forward through the power of result-driven communication, which is my definition of sales. So I've done a ton of things. I'm not going to bore you with any of them because only one thing is truly relevant to the talk today and probably to this audience, which is the company I'm running today. Close. We just recently bought uh, Close.com. It was only a five and a half year uh, negotiation. For those of you that care about the details, you can ping me later. And Close is a very simple company. We're an inside sales CRM business, right? Not a competitive category at all, right? There's not that many CRM choices out there for buyers. This is not an old category in SaaS. There's not really a lot of well-funded and well-run companies to compete with. And we are a, a real outlier in that space. Like the entire business, our entire company is 37 people, 37. We are fully distributed, it's a completely remote company, so we're in 12 different countries. We are highly profitable, which is also very different from the industry, not just that we're so small, but we are operating at a scale that is um, quite, it's not quite as big as kind of a smallest competitor, but it's when you take the revenue and profit we have per employee, it's insane. And when you look at the technology that we've built, we're incredibly competitive. Every, every day we win deals against companies where our smallest competitor is 450, 500 empo employees large, right? And uh, today I'm gonna share a little bit about our unique story and how we are winning in those markets, and especially in sales, if you're selling against tons and tons of competition, how to do that. Does that make sense so far? This is yes, this is no, this is I'm just sitting, I thought this would be music, and like the, the meditation room, I didn't know this is actually gonna be a Greek guy screaming at me on the silent stage. All right, so, uh, oh, before I forget it, I'll give you the goodies beforehand. If you wanna know a lot more about sales, um, and if you want material from me about sales, I've written over 10 books on the subject of selling. Those are highly actionable and tactical eBooks on the topic from how to give effective product demos, how to hire a first sales team, all that good stuff. You send me an email, bundle mofo, 
at steli at close.com. You'll get one beautiful link. You click that link, you get for free my entire content organized and well-structured for your pleasure and consumption, you and your teams, right? So just send me an email, you'll get all my stuff. So you don't have to worry about taking notes and missing something. You'll get everything I have, and I've already organized it for you so you can pick the things that are most relevant to you. All right, so this is a, who has seen this before? You know, the industry, the thing that comes out every year, the chart looks worse and worse, a bunch of people. So for those of you, because a lot of you didn't uh, raise your hands, I'll give you a simple, a simple rundown of this. Every year, we, there's a company that gives out a report that shows how many companies, in this case, are in the marketing tech space, right? And in 2011, it was around about 150, and it's kind of been doubling every year since, right? So it gets more and more and more and more companies, especially in software. And this is just one category. This is marketing tech. It's been doubling over the past you know, uh, eight years, and it's going to continue to double and get more and more competitive. This is round about what it looked like last year, towards the end of last year, and this is probably where it's going to look like towards the end of this year, and this is not going to get better. If somebody of you, who here has ever thought or said the words, we're in a very competitive space? Raise your hand. There you go, this is attrition. Like, the more you ask people to take action, the less energy they have. They're like, the first time they're like, yes! And they're like, okay, this is the fourth time I have to raise my hand. You know, let's earn that first. All right, I get it. So, the, the, I'm not going to really uh, uh, talk too much about trends and all that. In any category, if you're in business today, you're in a hyper-competitive category. I've never met, I meet, I talk to hundreds of entrepreneurs every month. I talk to a ton more salespeople every month, and nobody's ever said we're in a space that's not competitive at all. It's actually super simple to win customers because nobody's competing for our business. Everybody thinks they're in the most competitive category, and everybody feels the competition. If you are in a company or in a team that complains about competition, then you deserve the pain you're feeling every day. To me, it's very simple. You can either get better, you know, or you complain about the world getting more competitive, but it's not gonna stop. You just, I think what one thing that we need to learn how to get better and better at, especially on the sales side of things, but in general as entrepreneurs and businesses, is how to be incredibly competitive in insanely competitive spaces, this reality will never stop. So instead of complaining that some competitor copied something or raised more money than you or did this big marketing push or closed the deal by giving somebody a bigger discount, instead of complaining about the competition, you need to find ways to embrace the competition because it's a reality that's not going away. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we did it because, listen, if you told me seven, eight years ago that I would be running a CRM business, I would have punched you in the face. There was nothing inside of me that was like, ooh, CRM. That is a category nobody has looked at. This is something that has tons of untouched opportunity. Let's do that. Uh, that's not how it happened, right? We kind of just stumbled into that space, right? Uh, that was all the strategy we used. I get emails every day where somebody like, how did you choose this industry? What was the strategy that made you confident that you could compete in such an insanely competitive category? And I always say the same thing. The strategy was no strategy at all, right? It was just, was, we, we built something for ourselves. We were running an outsourced sales team on demand. We were doing sales for 200 venture-backed startups in, the, in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. And we had a bunch of engineers in the middle of that room full of salespeople doing sales for all kinds of different businesses that were writing software to help our sales reps do better. And eventually we're like, wait a second, this software is really awesome. Maybe one day it could be a product. And then in January 2013, we launched that product. And if today the story was that we failed three, four, five months later because the category was way too competitive and nobody cared that we had a cool piece of software, that story would make perfect sense to me. I'd be like, yeah, yet another company that built a cool product that nobody gave a shit about because there was a ton of other competition around. But that's how it worked out. We launched and we hit a nerve, and we had good timing, and we did a bunch of things really, really well. And today, we're running a fairly large business, and it's growing uh, larger every year. So what did we do? I'll go through this list very, very quickly. If any of these things you know, hits a nerve with you and you want to know a lot more, you send me an email, stelliaclose.com. You ask your question, I'll give you the answers, or my answers at least. All right, so first, we're a little lucky because we had a product vision that was drastically differentiated from the market. Everybody at the time where we did launch our CRM thought of CRMs as contact databases. This is the database that 
you know, pushes reporting, that does forecasting, that helps the company understand what the pipeline looks like, how much revenue is going to be generated, what all the information is. We thought of sales, like I said in the beginning in the intro, as result-driven communication. To me, selling is nothing else than communicating with an end goal in mind. There's a conversion. Anytime you communicate, there's an end goal in mind, you're selling or being sold to. It doesn't really matter what the context is. If you have children like I have, I have two boys, there's not a single communication we have that's not a negotiation where they try to, you know, convert me to something and I try to convert them to something else, right? So it doesn't really matter what the context is. And so we thought sales software has to be communication software. So if sales software is communication software, how would we build communication software for the modern salesperson? And how would that change how the CRM or the main tool that they use all day long look like? So we had a drastically different vision. When we launched with the first CRM to have two-way email syncing out of the box in the product. We're the first CRM to have calling VoIP over IP telephony out of the box in the product. We were the first, one, first CRM to have SMS right out of the box in the product. We had all these communication channels baked in because we wanted sales reps to communicate all day long and the CRM to do all the data entry on data automation and capturing of information in the background. The next thing we did is we were hyper-focused on a specific customer. This is, again, this is one of those things, this is the type of advice that when I hear it, when I used to hear it, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you need to be more niche and have a better understanding on who your ideal customer is. You've heard this, who here has not heard this before? Raise your hand, right? I didn't see anybody. I think somebody maybe, maybe behind this one, uh, one thing that it's all that I don't see. So we all heard this many, many times, but how hard is your company and how hard are you working on understanding your niche and your customer better? I would assume most of us are pretty lazy around this. This is, if I had to give advice about like how to lose weight, not that I'm an expert, my advice would be pretty simple, timeless advice. Eat broccoli and work out, motherfucker. Let's just move your body and put good stuff in it. It's not that complicated. The reason why that advice sucks is because I don't like broccoli and I don't want to sweat. I actually had this, my sister-in-law, we went to work out, she wanted to lose some weight, and she stopped after five minutes, and when I was like, is this a joke? Why are we stopping? What is this? And she's like, I started sweating. And I was like, okay, good, right? That's, that's why we're here, this is, this, is, this is what we want. And she's like, no, I hate sweating. And this sounds crazy, but this is, to me, the summary of all our problems. This to me, anytime I don't get what I want, it's because I want to lose weight, but I hate sweating, right? I want to lose weight, but I don't like, I want to do it conveniently. I want to do it in a way that's pleasurable. Hence why there's a million books about losing weight, there's a million workout routines, there's a gazillion industry. For what? For losing weight, it's not that complicated, right? It is mostly not that complicated, but it is very inconvenient. And that's true for most of the truths that I'll share with you today. I'm not going to tell you anything you've never heard before. I'm just going to tell you a bunch of stuff you've never done before, right? Or haven't done at, with the passion and the focus and the consistency and determination that you have to. So for us, from day one, we chose we're only going to focus on small and medium-sized businesses. And our stakeholder, even the tiniest company even has four or five people that meets multiple stakeholders. In that company, we're going to focus on the sales rep above everybody else, which is the one stakeholder every CRM didn't give a shit about, right? Because that stakeholder doesn't buy the CRM. It's not that the other CRMs are dumb, it's just that they figure out the pocketbook is somewhere else. So that's what we're going to focus on in terms of selling this and building the product. We focused on the individual user of the product, and that made a big difference in how we market it and how we sold the product. Product. We chose to have a completely different business model. We thought our, to ourselves, can we outcapital the competition in this space? Can we raise more money and hire more people, you know, and grow faster in the public markets than everybody else? And we're like, maybe, maybe not, but we're not excited about it. So we need to be drastically different in how we put together our business model. So from day one, we were uh, building a profitable business model, and a business model that was focused on building a team of 100 people generating 100 million in revenue, rather than trying to build a team of you know, 50,000 people doing 10 billion in revenue. Not that one is better than the other, just one seemed much better to us than the other. And that allowed us to act very differently in the way that we built the product and the custom we focused on. If you want to do 10, 20, 50 billion, and if you want to grow with hyper growth numbers to hit the investor projections and all that, it's going to be very hard not to go up market. No matter how much you start with your product and like we're dedicated to SMB, you're going to have a lot of push to go up market and build more and more enterprise features and acquire more and more enterprise customers, which means you're broadening your focus on who you are serving. You're serving now everybody, the individual, the small business, the medium-sized business, the large business, the biggest business, right? And when you go that broad in the beginning, it's very hard to compete, right? Especially as you're small in the early days. The other thing that we figured out, and this is more by, again, by mistake than by actual purpose, 
is that when we looked at the marketing channels and the way that our competitors were acquiring customers, it was very clear to us that we're not going to out-advertise them, we're not going to out-PR them, we're not going to out-sell them even with more salespeople than them. But in 2013, when we looked around, we thought all their content really sucks. Right? These blog posts are written for search engines, these ebooks and white papers stink. Right? This is all content that has the flavor of the 80s. Like, this is just this is shit. I wouldn't, we wouldn't read this to learn how to sell today, to learn how to succeed with sales. So we arrogantly or ignorantly thought, we're just going to out-teach our competition. Let's create better content than anybody else. And that's what we did. That's all we did. We only did content marketing. And very quickly, a lot of people seemed to be in agreement with us that they enjoyed our content. We built a pretty large audience that then ended up being kind of the, the basis for the growth of our business. And we said from the get-go, we want to build a, a no BS billion dollar business, right? And bullshit is an individual definition. But in our definition was like our content, when you read it, you should know what to do next. It should be actionable and timeless. I want to give you advice that was true 20 years ago and will be true 30 years from now. I don't want to give you advice that in two months is, is outdated, right? I'm not interested in that. I want to master the fundamentals that are timeless and get really, really good at that. And then when we looked at our pricing, because we wanted to be profitable and because we thought about our positioning in the market, we knew we cannot compete on price. We cannot be the cheapest solution because we don't have unlimited uh, uh, capital resources to do the race to the bottom, right? Uh, Jeff Bezos, the famous quote, your margin is my opportunity. Jeff Bezos is amazing, but we're not building Amazon. We're not going to outcompete with somebody on the race to the bottom because we don't have the capital to do that, and our business model doesn't fit into this. So we have to be a value product. We have to be a premium product in this space. When we launched, we launched a CRM that was promising you to help you close more deals that didn't have reporting in it. January 2013, we launched without reporting. We're like, trust us, you're going to sell more. Can't quite tell you how much more, but just go, go, with, our, go with us. It's going to be good. Right? And people still bought. And we were the most expensive CRM in the space. Think about that. Think about the attitude and the philosophy it takes to launch something that is not a complete product yet, to be the newest player in the space, the smallest player in the space, and to ask for the most money in the space to get a lot of people to buy, right? So when you complain that your competitors are cheaper or they have a bigger brand or they have a feature you are lacking, all these things I get are realities that do influence and make certain things harder. But at the same time, anytime somebody comes to me and goes, oh my God, this is so hard to, to win when, you know, with all these things against, stacked against us, I always tell them, thank God, because otherwise you wouldn't have a fucking job. The only reason you and your job exists is because this product doesn't fucking sell itself beautifully, right? If it sold itself, supported itself, onboarded itself, if it did everything on its own, we don't need humans around, right? We don't need salespeople if the job, which is what we all want to do, is just taking orders, right? And then insisting, no, no, you don't have to pay that much. Oh, really? You're going to pay triple because you like me so much you won't make my quarterly numbers that great? Like, that's not why you have a job. Your job... Is, exists because it is difficult to sell your product, because there's competition, because there's features lacking, because there's a, a marketing campaign that went wrong, because there are customers that are pissed because there was some bug or some bad news about you. And your job is to have such great skill that you're able to overcome that and change that relationship with a customer and still provide value to them and, and build a partnership and a bond with them. If you can do that, you're fucking great at selling and you're worth every penny you're making because you're making tons of money. And if you're not, then you can complain all day long. But I guarantee you, no matter what company you're with, it, grass always looks greater uh, because it's fucking fake at the neighbor's house, right? You go over there and then you realize everything is fucked up here as well, right? Nothing works here too. I didn't know about all these problems they have. Like this is, every company is fucked up, just like every human is messed up. We're all, we're all a little messed up. There's, not, there's no person that has figured it out, and there's no company that's a perfect place. There's so many companies that I know things of, secrets of, nobody knows of, and I look, and I have all these people that come to me like, oh my God, I admire this company so much. And I go, I also admire it, but I admire the real company with all the problems and all the fucked up shit because that's reality. No business is amazing. So stop complaining about the competition or the business you're in when it comes to acquiring customers and convincing them to buy. And then you need to be hyper-focused. When you're in a hyper-competitive market, you need to be hyper-focused. You cannot say yes to everything just because your competitors do. 
If you want to be the best and stand out from the noise, you have to be better at saying no to a bunch of shit. When we started, we said no to so many things, it seemed insane. We're like, no partnerships. There's no discounts. Full price, we're not negotiating on discount. There is no, we're never going to do an enterprise deal. We're like big organizations email us. We're uh, IBM and we're considering uh, close. When can we have a meeting with our uh, buying committee? And we'd be like, never, right? Uh, all information we have is on the website. And if you want to sign up and fuck around with the trial, you know, go at it. Uh, and if you want to buy, there's a self sign up. But, you know, we would advise you to look at these other options because we're not really an organization that's focused on catering, servicing, and partnering up with massive, massive organizations. It's just not for us. And that needs balls. Like, we all go, oh, we're not in the enterprise business until a big enterprise company comes and waves a bit of money our way. And then we're like, all of a sudden, well, we're flexible. You know, we're very, you have to be open minded. Let's take a meeting. Well, it's just a meeting. Let's just, uh, let's just explore this. Let's learn a little bit. Let's listen. Maybe we'll learn about the future. And then they wave a bit of money and they're like, well, we could do this one time. Maybe we should move faster to the enterprise than we thought. Right? And that's how you get derailed and defocused. And 12 months later of like chasing this big deal, they go with a competitor because they specialized on closing these kind of deals. They have the infrastructure, they have the people, they have the resources, they have the technology. Now you wasted all this energy and time chasing something you should have said no to and drawn a line in the sand to know what to focus on. The secret to focus is being very good at creating uh, a list of things you're not going to do. Every morning I start a not-to-do list. I put down things, shit, I'm not going to fucking do today. All, right? All the things I might want to do that I'm not going to do. Things that are going to be easy to distract me, I'm not going to let me distract me. Every year we put together a non-product roadmap. Here's the stuff we're not going to fucking do next year. right? Because we're all humans, we get distracted, we get like emotionally confused, and then whatever is thrown our way, we're like, oh, maybe we should do this. Yes, everybody's doing this. This is how you derail in focus, and this is how competition then becomes harder and harder to win against. So I think one philosophy and the, the summary of everything that I told you about us from day one is that we always wanted to play to win and not play to play. When people did X, we didn't just go, oh, our competitors are doing X. We probably also should do X. We always told ourselves, well, can we do X better than them? Can we be the best in X? If the answer was not yes, if we couldn't see a path to winning, we didn't play. We didn't even participate. What's the point to going and playing this game if all we can do is participate? It does, that doesn't matter. So we always ask ourselves, what's a way we can truly dominate and win? And there's so many companies and founders that are just looking at what everybody else does. And they're like, oh my god, anxiety. We need to do all these things. And then when a competitor starts something new, oh my god, we, they did this for a week already. Right, let's just show, maybe you should copy it because it serves your customer really, really well. I'm not against copying. Copy is awesome, right? Just take all the hard work and decision making and all the mistakes and then you just surpass, you just jump over that and get right to the solution, right? It can be an amazing strategy, but only if it makes sense to you, your customer, your business model, and if you can follow that strategy in a way that will help you win. Here's another thing people always think quantity kills quality. And it's not true, it enhances it. I get this, every year there's like some kind of a fucking blog post that says, email is dead. Have you ever seen this? Hey, raise your hand, real high, just with energy, as if you mean it, right? Have you ever seen this, that email is dead? Thank you for the extra energy, I saw that. I see everything, okay? So, even if it's silent. So, you know, email is dead. Oh my God, every inbox is full. The reason our cold emails or sales emails don't work is because there's too much email. Email just doesn't work anymore. No! You know what happens when your inbox is full of bullshit? Is that when you get an email that's great, it stands out. You know how many great, you know how many cold emails I get every day? And this is the, you know, the karma that I live with. Like half of them, well, about 60% of them use templates I teach. They went to my blog, they copied and pasted my template, and then they cold emailed me with it. Right? I get a shit ton of these. You know, so I get a ton, I get like hundreds of cold emails every fucking day. You know how many great cold emails I've gotten in the last two quarters? One. I can recite it to you word for word. I can remember it. I've told already, probably by now, a couple of audiences, so a few thousand people about this email, right? So the same thing with cold calling. Oh my God, the, too many people call, too many people tweet. There's so much noise. Yeah, there is noise, but if you have a very strong signal, noise actually enhances it because you stand out from the crowd. 
It only hurts you if everybody else does the same thing as you, if what you do is the same as everybody else. Then you're disappearing in the white noise. Your cold email template is the same as the other thousand cold email templates. So now nobody opens your fucking cold email template. And rightfully so. You deserve to die in the business, metaphorically speaking, right? You deserve to live as a human. But your email deserves the death it, it receives, right? Because you spend zero effort, zero thoughtfulness, and you want to have better results than everybody else. This is, this is us humans. Like, how can I lose weight without the sweating and without the, you know, not eating pizza and burger every day, right? Yeah, there's a magical pill, and that magical pill is the hack. That magical pill is like the illusion that if we only had this feature, if our prices only were a little smaller, if our marketing was only a little better, then selling this would be easy. And I say bullshit, right? I've been around long enough and I've seen enough companies where every time you fix the one thing that was the biggest reason we can't sell, boom, there's a new biggest reason we can't sell now, right? So what you need to do is not complain about there's too many emails, too many calls, too many people using this software, that software. What you need to do is spend a bit more time mastering the fundamentals and making your email stand out, your calls stand out. The way you interact with customers stand out, right? This is a great example of this. Like, How many times as a salesperson do we not use the opportunity to create true intimacy and true understanding of who our customers are, who our prospects are, and what their life look like, and what the pressures are they're in, and what they psychologically go through to make a buying decision? All we come to the table with is our selfish bullshit. Oh, let me show you my product. Oh, let me go through my presentation. Oh, let me ask you these bullshit seven questions to qualify you. Oh, let me schedule another call with you with other people in my company that want to fucking do their fucking presentation and ask you their seven questions. It's all selfish. Why not take a little, take a little bit of time to truly try to understand your customers and build relationships with those in a way that stands out from the competition? As long as human beings make buying decisions, you have a massive opportunity, and that's building relationships. People like to buy from people they like. People remember people that touched them in some way or impacted them in some way that was powerful. Once the world is one where computers make all the buying and selling decisions and they just talk to each other, make perfect decision making for all of us, awesome, we're all out of a job, and then uh, who knows what the world looks like. But until then, your value proposition is you're a human and you have a chance to make another human being feel something that he or she remembers. All right, so I officially had 30 minutes. They told me once a 25 minute time is over, I'll see a mi minus five minute timer. I have no fucking clue where I'm at right now. How many minutes do I have? Two minutes, beautiful. That's perfect for my last story. So I'll tell you about the most impactful sales experience I've ever had in my life, and this is still true and something you can do no matter what you sell, even if you sell in a hyper-competitive software space. When I was 19, I started making a ton of money. I come from a very poor background. And I wanted to do something that would make me feel successful and rich. I wanted to buy a very expensive suit. Again, I come from like nothing, right? So I'm, I was like a little limited in my idea of like success. So I was like, all right, I have like 3,000 euros back in Germany. I'm gonna spend all the money on the most expensive shit I can. And then I will feel amazing. So I go into this store and I hate shopping, right? And just like any other man that hates shopping, I walk in and I'm like, no eye contact, no eye contact, right? I don't want anybody to talk to me that's gonna make me feel uncomfortable. And there's a gentleman, an older gentleman, uh, that saw me peeked that there is weak prey in his store and he started trying to approach me. I was like, no, 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 no. I know what I'm looking for, just leave me alone. I'm just browsing around, don't talk to me. But eventually he started up a chat with me and he was so smooth, smooth like butter. He made me feel comfortable. He was giving me all these facts. He was looking at me going, oh, I have a vision for you, young man. This is what we need to do. And he was like giving me all these tidbits, explaining to me how do you, how do, you do the tie? How do you, you know, how do you have to think about these purchases? Because he knew I have no fucking idea. At the end, I felt amazing. I felt successful. I'm at the counter. He's packaging up all my stuff, right? And I'm excited. It needs to be a big number. I've never purchased something that expensive. And he rings me up and it's like 3,700 euros or something for all the shit that he sold me. I'm like, yes, this is it. Yeah, see, I'm going to pay this. I'm very young, but I have the money. And I put my hand in my jacket and I realize I don't have my fucking wallet with me. And there was intense pain in that moment because in my mind, in my little mind, insecure mind, I was like, he's going to think this is too expensive. So now I'm like, oh, I forgot my wallet. <laughs> I didn't know that clothes cost that much money, so oh, my wallet is not here. Right? So I'm like super insecure about this. 
There's a big line behind me of people that makes me even more nervous about it. I'm like, ah, oh, uh, I'm really sorry. I totally forgot my wallet. Uh, can you put the stuff to the side? Uh, and I promise I'll come back and I'll buy it immediately. And he looks at me and he goes, no. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, no. <laughs> Sweating. He's like, what do you mean come back? These are your things. You take them with you. And whenever you have a chance this week, you swing by and you pay. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. I insist. Go. Go on. Wear those clothes. And whenever you have a chance, come back. Take the clothes. You know when you do this, you open the door and you go, is there an alarm system? Is this a, a joke? And i tell you what I did next. If, if he had put the things to the side and told me to come back and pay, I told you what would have happened. I would have never returned into this fucking place. I hate shopping. It took me a long time. I was very, very... Uh, you know, I felt very insecure about the whole thing. But here's what, I, what happened instead. I canceled my next three meetings. I drove home. I picked up my wallet and drove straight back to that fucking place and paid. Here's what happened next. Every month, I spend a couple of thousand dollars for me and my employees in that place with that salesperson. This is a story that's 17 years old. This happened 17 years ago. I don't remember what ties I bought. I don't remember what suits I bought. I don't remember the brands. But one thing I will remember forever is how he made me feel. I will never forget that. I've told this story to half a million people on podcasts, on big stages, in books that I've written. I've told this story so many times. And I will continue to tell it for the rest of my life. And that's the power of selling. That's the power of interacting with people. You have the opportunity to make somebody feel something different than another human makes them feel. And if you use that opportunity well, you're going to be able to compete and sell successfully no matter how competitive your spaces. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.